The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by Robert Louis Stevenson Chapter 9 Dr. Lanyon's Narrative On the 9th of January, now four days ago, I received by the evening delivery a registered envelope addressed in the hand of my colleague and old school companion, Henry Jekyll. I was a good deal surprised by this, for we were by no means in the habit of correspondence. I had seen the man, dined with him indeed the night before, and I could imagine nothing in our intercourse that should justify formality of registration. The contents increased my wonder, for this is how the letter ran. 10th December, 18. Dear Lanyon, you are one of my oldest friends, and although we may have differed at times on scientific questions, I cannot remember, at least on my side, any break in our affection. There was never a day when, if you had said to me, Jekyll, my life, my honor, my reason depend upon you, I would not have sacrificed my left hand to help you. Lanyon, my life, my honor, my reason are all at your mercy, for if you fail to me tonight, I am lost. You might suppose after this preface that I'm going to ask you for something dishonorable to grant. Judge for yourself. I want you to postpone all other engagements for tonight. I, even if you were summoned to the bedside of an emperor, to take a cab unless your carriage should be actually at the door. And with this letter in your hand for consultation, to drive straight to my house. Poole, my butler, has his orders. You'll find him waiting your arrival with a locksmith. The door of my cabinet is then to be forced, and you are to go in alone, to open the glazed press, letter E, on the left hand, breaking the lock if it be shut, and to draw out with all its contents as they stand the fourth drawer from the top, or, which is the same thing, the third from the bottom. In my extreme distress of mind, I have a morbid fear of misdirecting you, but even if I am in error, you may know the right drawer by its contents, some powders, a vial, and a paper book. This drawer I beg of you to carry back with you to Cavendish Square, exactly as it stands. That is the first part of the service. Now for the second. You should be back if you set out at once on the receipt of this, long before midnight. But I will leave you that amount of margin, not only in the fear of one of those obstacles that can neither be prevented nor foreseen, but because an hour when your servants are in bed is to be preferred for what will then remain to do. At midnight, then, I have to ask you to be alone in your consulting room, to admit with your own hand into the house a man who will present himself in my name, and to place in his hands the drawer that you will have brought with you from my cabinet. Then you will have played your part and earned my gratitude completely. Five minutes afterwards, if you insist upon an explanation, you will have understood that these arrangements are of capital importance, and that by the neglect of one of them, fantastic as they must appear, you might have cha charged your conscience with my death or the shipwreck of my reason. Confident as I am that you will not trifle with this appeal, my heart sinks and my hand troubles at the bare thought of such a possibility. Think of me at this hour in a strange place, laboring under a blackness of distress that no fancy can exaggerate, and yet well aware that if you will but punctually serve me, my troubles will roll away like a story that is told. Serve me, my dear Lanyon, and save your friend, H.J. P.S. I had already sealed this up when a fresh terror struck upon my soul. It is possible that the post office may fail me, and this letter not come into your hands until tomorrow morning. In that case, dear Lanyon, do my errand when it should be most convenient for you in the course of the day, and once more expect my messenger at midnight. It may then already be too late. And if that night passes without event, you will know that you have seen the last of Henry Jekyll. Upon the reading of this letter, I made sure my colleague was insane. But till that was proved beyond the possibility of doubt, I felt bound to do as he requested. The less I understood of this far ago, the less I was in a position to judge of its importance. And an appeal so worded could not be set aside without a grave responsibility. I rose accordingly from table, got into a hansom, and drove straight to Jekyll's house. The butler was awaiting my arrival. He had received by the same post as mine a registered letter of instruction, and had sent at once for a locksmith and a carpenter. The tradesman came while we were yet speaking, and we moved in a body to old Dr. Denman's surgical theater, from which, as you are doubtless aware, 
Jekyll's private cabinet is most conveniently entered. The door was very strong, the lock excellent. The carpenter avowed he would have great trouble and have to do much damage if force were to be used, and the locksmith was near despair. But this last was a handy fellow, and after two hours' work the door stood open. The press marked E was unlocked, and I took out the drawer and had it filled up with straw and tied in a sheet and returned with it to Cavendish Square. Here I proceeded to examine its contents. The powders were neatly enough made up, but not with the nicety of the dispensing chemist, so that it was plain they were of Jekyll's private manufacture. And when I opened one of the wrappers, I found what seemed to be, to me, a simple crystalline salt of a white color. The vial to which I next turned my attention might have been about half full of a blood-red liquor, which was highly pungent to the sense of smell, and seemed to me to contain phosphorus and some volatile ether. At the other ingredients, I could make no guess. The book was an ordinary version book and contained little but a series of dates. Well, these covered a period of many years, but I observed that the entries ceased nearly a year ago, and quite abruptly. Here and there a brief remark was appended to a date, usually no more than a single word. Double, occurring perhaps six times in a total of 700 entries, and once very early in the list and followed by several marks of exclamation, total failure. All this, though it whetted my curiosity, told me little that was definite. Here were a vial of some salt, and the record of a series of experiments that had led, like to many of Jekyll's investigations, to no end of practical usefulness. How could the presence of these articles in my house affect either the honor, the sanity, or the life of my flighty colleague? If his messenger could go to one place, why could he not go to another? And even granting some impediment, why was this gentleman to be received by me in secret? Well, the more I reflected, the more convinced I grew that I was dealing with a case of cerebral disease, and though I dismissed my servants to bed... I loaded an old revolver that I might be found in some posture of self-defense. Twelve o'clock had scarce rung out over London ere the knocker sounded very gently on the door. I went myself at the summons and found a small man crouching against the pillars of the portico. "'Are you come from Dr. Jekyll?' I asked. He told me yes by a constrained gesture, and when I had bidden him enter, he did not obey me without a searching backward glance into the darkness of the square." There was a policeman not far off, advancing with his bull's-eye open, and at the sight I thought my visitors started and made greater haste. These particulars struck me, I confess, disagreeably, and as I followed him into the light, bright light of the consulting room, I kept my hand ready on my weapon. Here, at last, I had a chance of clearly seeing him. I had never set eyes on him before, so much was certain. He was small, as I have said, and I was struck besides with the shocking expression of his face, with his remarkable combination of great muscular activity and great apparent debility of constitution, and, last but not least, with the odd subjective disturbance caused by his neighborhood. This bore some resemblance to incipient rigor, and was accompanied by a marked sinking of the pulse. Well, at the time, I set it down to some idiosyncratic personal distaste, and merely wondered at the acuteness of the symptoms but I have since had reason to believe the cause to lie much deeper in the nature of man, and to turn on some nobler hinge than the principle of hatred. This person, who had thus from the first moment of his entrance struck me in what I can only describe as a disgustful curiosity, was dressed in a fashion that would have made an ordinary person laughable. His clothes, that is to say, although they were of rich and sober fabric, were enormously too large for him in every measurement the trousers hanging on his legs and rolled up to keep them from the ground, the waist of the coat below his haunches, and the collar sprawling wide upon his shoulders. Strange to relate, this ludicrous accoutrement was far from moving me to laughter. Rather, as there was something abnormal and misbegotten in the very essence of the creature that now faced me, something seizing, surprising, and revolting. This fresh disparity seemed but to fit in with and to reinforce it. So that to my interest in the man's nature and character, there was added a curiosity as to his origin, his life, his fortune, and status in the world. These observations, though they've taken so great a space to be set down in, were yet the work of a few seconds. My visitor was, indeed, on fire with some somber excitement. "'Have you got it?' he cried. 
Have you got it? And so lively was his impatience that he even laid his hand upon my arm and sought to shake me. I put him back, conscious at his touch of a certain icy pang along my blood. Come, sir, said I. You forget that I have not yet the pleasure of your acquaintance. Be seated, if you please. And I showed him an example and sat down myself in my customary seat, and with as fair an imitation of my ordinary manner to a patient as the lateness of the hour, the nature of my preoccupations, and the horror I had of my visitor would suffer me to muster. I beg your pardon, Dr. Lanyon, he replied civilly enough. What you say is very well founded, and my impatience has shown its heels to my politeness. I come here at the insistence of your colleague, Dr. Henry Jekyll, on a piece of business of some moment. I understood. He paused and put his hand to his throat, and I could see, in spite of his uncollected manner, that he was wrestling against the approaches of the hysteria. I understood a drawer. But here I took pity on my visitor's suspense, and some perhaps on my growing curiosity. Well, there it is, sir, said I, pointing to the drawer, where it lay on the floor behind a table and still covered with the sheet. He sprang to it and then paused, and then laid his hand upon his heart. I could hear his teeth grate with the convulsive action of his jaws, and his face was so ghastly to see that I grew alarmed, both for his life and reason. Compose yourself, said I. He turned a dreadful smile to me, and as if with the decision of despair, plucked away the sheet. At sight of the contents, he uttered one loud sob of such immense relief that I sat petrified. And the next moment, in a voice that was already fairly well under control, "'Have you a graduated glass?' he asked. I rose from my place with something of an effort and gave him what he asked. He thanked me with a smiling nod, measured out a few minims of the red tincture, and added one of the powders. The mixture was at first of a reddish hue, began in proportion as the crystals melted, to brighten in color, to effervesce audibly, and to throw off small fumes of vapor. Suddenly and at the same moment the ebullition ceased, and the compound changed to a dark purple, which faded again more slowly to a watery green. My visitor, who had watched these metamorphoses with a keen eye, smiled and set down the glass upon the table, and then turned and looked upon me with an air of scrutiny. "'And now,' said he, to settle what remains. Will you be wise? Will you be guided? Will you suffer me to take this glass in my hand and go forth from your house without further parley? Or has the greed of curiosity too much command of you? Think before you answer, for it shall be done as you decide. As you decide, you should be left as you were before, and neither richer nor wiser, unless the sense of service rendered to a man in mortal distress may be counted as a kind of riches of the soul. Or, if you shall so prefer to choose... A new province of knowledge and new avenues to fame and power shall be laid open to you, here in this room upon the instant. And your sight shall be blasted by a prodigy to stagger the unbelief of Satan. Sir, said I, affecting a coolness that I was far from truly possessing, you speak enigmas, and you'll perhaps not wonder that I hear you with no very strong impression of belief. But I've gone too far in the way of inexplicable services to pause before I see the end. Oh, it is well, replied my visitor. Lanyon, you remember your vows. What follows is under the seal of our profession. And now you've so long been bound to the most narrow and material views. You have denied the virtue of transcendental medicine. You who have derided your superiors. Behold. He put the glass to his lips and drank at one gulp. A cry followed. He reeled and staggered clutched at the table and held on, staring with injected eyes, gasping with open mouth. And as I looked, there came, I thought, a change. He seemed to swell. His face became suddenly black and the features seemed to melt and alter. And the next moment I had sprung to my feet and leaped back against the wall, my arms raised to shield me from that prodigy, my mind submerged in terror. Oh God, I screamed, and oh God, again and again. For there before my eyes, pale and shaken and half fainting, and groping before him with his hands like a man restored from death, there stood Henry Jekyll. What he told me the next hour I cannot bring my mind to set on paper. I saw what I saw. I heard what I heard. And my soul sickened at it. And yet now when that sight has faded from my eyes, I ask myself if I believe it. And I cannot answer. My life is shaken to its roots. Sleep has left me. The deadliest terror sits by me at all hours of the day and night. 
and I feel that my days are numbered, and that I must die. And yet I shall die incredulous. As for the moral turpitude that man unveiled to me, even with the tears of penitence, I cannot even in memory dwell on it without a start of horror. I will say but one thing, Utterson, and that, if you can bring your mind to it, will be more than enough. The creature who crept into my house that night was on Jekyll's own confession, known by the name of Hyde, and hunted for in every corner of the land as the murderer of Carew. Hasty Lanyon, 1826-1828